and they saw it was good. Sunday. On behalf of our school committee, 
I would like to personally thank your congregation for the generous monetary donation to be used for summer camp scholarships. Every kid deserves a rich and rewarding summer camp experience. Your donation directly impacts our students. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. With, Len, with love, Ben Karski, principal.
also mentions another thing, that the sun will be darkened in the sky. And tomorrow we have almost a full a solar eclipse. So you got all of these things coming together. So it's a real good thing that we're here because Jesus may be coming by Tuesday. So it's a good thing that we're here. But as I said, context means a lot. And I don't believe in any of those kinds of things. I think there's a purpose for those. And I don't think it's like an actual checklist that Jesus is giving us uh, telling the end time is coming because we've been waiting for the end time as we will talk about ever since Easter, the first Easter. And so... There is context, which is important. So I don't think it's the sign of the end time, but context is really important for reading the Bible because we are not locked into the uh, words that are printed on the page. We believe in still speaking word of God. And that means that when you have the word on the page, you take it in, you let it dwell in you, you think about it, and then you interpret it and put it in context. And that allows us to allow God to continue speaking to us instead of speaking to us through people who lived 2,000 and more years ago. So please keep that idea of context in mind um, as we hear the readings, as we hear the sermon, because uh, context is really what opens up the still speaking word of God. And so let us now enter into our service with our opening hymn and candle lighting, that Easter day with joy was bright, blue hymn number 299. We declare to each other the hope Easter shares with us, the hope that we too will share in the promised resurrection. The disciples gathered in awe around the risen Savior. We are also called together to share in Jesus' presence at worship. How good and pleasant it is when kindred souls live together in unity. Easter binds us together as one people. Easter's gift of hope must be shared. Others doubt, we must try to convince them that Jesus lives. 
We gather to testify to God's grace. We will share our Easter stories and ourselves to bring others to the risen Savior. Now coming to gather this congregation in person and all those online via Zoom are you as his You pour out upon us the oil of gladness, gracious God, as we gather in the name of our risen Savior. You have given us the word of life. We have heard and seen your greatest of all gifts, and we testify to the mystery we have experienced in this season of Easter joy. May Jesus Christ, the risen and glorified Savior, be known among us in our sacred times at worship and in our daily lives renewed by the Easter faith. May our thoughts center on the message that light has come and chase the darkness away, that this community has removed isolation and that joy has been heaped upon us so that we may share the news of the empty tomb with all the world. Be with us now as we continue to offer our, our Easter hallelujahs. Amen. so far away and then so close, that moon can come right in front of that 
that sun and block out the entire sun. And I think that's just so cool to even think about that that happens. So you don't want to look at the eclipse without the glasses. You burn your retinas. It can really do a lot of damage. You don't want to take pictures of your phone. It can actually fry your phone. But the, the reason I wanted to show this to you is that these eclipses, they can predict when they're coming for like decades in advance. I'm sure they can reach out, you know, hundreds of years in advance. And that's all because as big as the sun is, as big as the moon is, we know exactly what they're going to do. So we know exactly when the moon is going to get in front of the sun and where it's going to block off that sun, at what day exactly. It starts tomorrow here at like 2.37. They know exactly the time. They know exactly when it's going to happen again because these are all guided by physical laws that really don't change a whole heck of a lot. So God set all of these things in motion, these physical laws, and that kind of just takes care of itself. But we, for as big as that sun is, as cool as that moon is, we have the ability. God says all of these things are going to work in order so that we can plan it out centuries in advance. But when it comes to us, God doesn't know what we're going to do tomorrow afternoon. God doesn't know what we're going to do a year from now. God doesn't know what we're going to do 10 years from now. Because God allows us to say no to God. The sun can't say no to God. The moon can't say no to God. But you, even before, you can say no to God. And that is such an awesome power that God of everything has looked down on us and says to each one of us, you have to choose to follow I'm not going to force you, like I'm going to force the sun and the moon to dance this way tomorrow. That's, there's no choice. It's going to happen. But with us, we have that gift of choice because God loves us so much that God wants us to love him, not be afraid of him, not be forced to do what he says, but to choose to do that. And so as magnificent as that eclipse is going to be tomorrow, I'm going to go out and look with my special sunglasses. It's even more awesome. When you think about the God of everything says to you and to me, you can say no to me, because that's the only way when you say yes to me that it means anything. So that choice is really a special blessing, and I hope that Sunday School and Church uh, help you say yes to God. Okay, have a wonderful Sunday School. Okay, bye-bye now. Bye-bye. And our special music is To a Wild Rose. Is that you, Saul? Okay, I'm going to stay right here.
for us to share our joys, our celebrations, and our concerns. And we would like to mention continuing prayers for Ukraine, because sad to say, um, as we enter into spring, there's also going to be an increase in the violence in that war-torn area of Ukraine. And so we pray for Ukraine, we pray for peace there. We also pray for a peace in that war between Israel and Hamas. The devastation there is just getting almost unimaginable. Um, and so it is an intractable situation. It's not going to go away. And we pray that God may help uh, the ones involved and us uh, to find a way to uh, live together somehow. We also continue to pray for our nation as we face the reality of persistent and institutional racism. And I offer uh, prayers for friends of mine, Richard and Joseph, and one who was battling a severe blood disorder. Also, um, prayers for, I don't know if you, I think some of you may know her, Jane Pease, uh, goes to the Wakely Congregational Church, um, kind of active in different uh, church activities you may have seen her at, and she just passed away from cancer, so uh, pray for her eternal rest, and also for her husband, John, um, that he may have the gift of his Christian faith as, as well. Uh, does anybody have any joy, celebration, concerns you'd like to share at this time? Seeing none, let us now turn to our yellow sheet then to offer our prayers for them. So let us pray for Alan, Alice, Simeon, Tom, Antonia, Anthony, Angie, R, Bill, Bill, Bonnie, Brenda, Chris and family, Cheryl, Cindy, Edna, Frank, Grayson, Irv, Jeff, Jim, John, John, Kathy, Leslie, Liz, Liz, Lynn, Marcia, Mary Jane, Joe, Mary Lou, Michelle, Mike, Pauline, Sandra, Sandra and John, Steve, Stephen, Thelma, Trudy, Virginia and Richard, Wayne, victims of violence and natural disasters anywhere in the world, we pray for peace on earth. Now that we start public worship, Let's just turn inward for a few moments of silence to offer God those prayers that we choose just not to say out loud. So a few moments of silence.
that place here in your sanctuary is a symbol of our love for you and for all others. So you already heard that first reading that Sue shared with us. The earliest Christians, following the example of Jesus and the disciples, sold everything that they had and they lived together. There were no rich and there were no poor. That example is from how the earliest Christians lived. They passed on that tradition of community awareness, that we are in this together, that we care for one another, that if one hurts, we should all hurt, and that if one is exceedingly blessed, it should be shared. That has been a message that has been shared as Christians for 2,000 years now, from the very first church in the very first years of our faith. And so that same message of Christian generosity and concern is what motivates us to give and to support this church so we may continue to be God's presence in this community. So for all that you do and all that you give so that we may continue to be this house of God, thank you. And may God bless these gifts to his purposes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
2017, the last eclipse, and they were telling stories, and I hope you remember this, it's not just me making this up, but people were taking sunscreen and putting it on their eyes so they could look at the eclipse. And all they did was they burned their eyes with the sunscreen and from looking at the eclipse. So we're not always the, the, the brightest bulb on the shelf sometimes. And so, you know, yesterday also, Sharon and I went over to UMass and uh, we, we saw the Mingus Dynasty based on Charles Mingus's music. And these professional musicians came in and they worked throughout the day with these high school students in their jazz ensembles. And it just really impresses me who you know, can barely do you know, this on the piano, um, that these kids are like 16, 17 years old. They're so confident, they're so talented. And two of the, the high schools that won the competition, they actually got to play before the Mingus Dynasty did. And out of all these kids up there, the one kid, he's got to be a jazz drummer. He's got to be the drummer. He's got his shades on. It's a dark auditorium, and he's got his shades on, because that looks cool. And so, obviously, you know, context, this does not look cool. So, you know, you don't use this for driving, you don't use this for, for machinery, and you don't use this to try to look cool at a jazz concert. So context means an awful, awful lot. And in that first story, first story, that first passage that we heard from Sue, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a story about the earliest church, and context is really important to understand it. So in the earliest church, the Jerusalem church, it says the apostles are there teaching. This is the church that knew Jesus and knew the followers of Jesus, and they knew how Jesus lived, and they knew how the apostles lived. And so they didn't have two coins to rub between them. And so that's the example that they knew of Jesus, and they assumed that it just meant that it was going to continue forward. Maybe you remember the, the story. Um, the Pharisees come up to test Jesus, and they say, you know, are we going to pay our taxes to Caesar or not? And Jesus puts his hands in his pocket. I don't have, I don't have a coin. You know, you got, no, nobody's got a coin. So he has to turn to his opponents to get a coin. So between the 13 of them, they don't have a single coin to make a point. And so that idea of that poverty that Jesus lived, the poverty of living together as this 13 and just finding a way somehow to survive, never accumulate and just survive, that's passed on to the earliest church. And so when De Jesus dies and resurrects and leaves them, goes to heaven, well, these disciples that were there in Jerusalem and the ones that had seen Jesus, they continued that kind of lifestyle. And, and so they sell all their possessions, it says today. And what they do is they take all of the stuff that they own, they sell it and they give it to the church, and then the church, could, together, they live off the proceeds of everything they sold. And so what you have is, is communism, okay? It's simply communism. You sell everything, no one owns anything. It's given to the church, the church distributes it, and you all live together. Now, hey, I like all of you. I hope you like me. But I don't want to spend 24-7 with all of you. You know, I mean, Sharon and I, we barely survive 24-7, never mind all of us living together. So that's what the early church was doing, though. They were living together. All their proceeds were in one pot, no one was rich and no one was poor. So if you're going to read the Bible literally without context, and there are a lot of people that read the Bible like that. The pages on the words on the page have to be read just the way they are forevermore, never change, never context, never interpret them. If you really believe that, then we should really be living in some big group home. No one, none of us has anything individually. We all own it together. And I can't imagine American literalists, fundamentalists, the ones that you hear about, like Christian nationalists, they want to base the country on the way that the Bible says that the country should be run, but they pick and choose what they want. And so they never ever quote what Sue read about, you know, from the Bible about communism because they don't like that idea. It's just as inspired as anything else, but they don't like it, so they don't quote it. And so if you start picking and choosing what part of the Bible you want to quote literally and which ones you want to conveniently ignore, that's not really biblical literalism because you're not reading the Bible uh, for what it says. You're picking and choosing what you want the Bible to say. So context means a lot. So they, they have their own way of having interpretation, but they don't admit to it. And that bothers me. You know, if you're going to really read the Bible literally, then you read the Bible literally. But we are proudly not literalists. We believe in the still speaking word of God. We really believe that God still speaks to us through changing, um, through changing interpretations of the biblical word. And so if we go back to this, we realize that that earliest church, we find out from church history that after the pages of the Bible close, 
Um, history after that, there was this group in Jerusalem called the Ebionites, and that just means the poor. And they, they were in Jerusalem. And these groups, the poor, were there, I think, because they're descendants of this group. If you sell everything you have, you can live for maybe a real good year comfortably. You know, if I sold everything that I had, I could live really good for a year. Come 13 months from now, I don't know what I would be doing, but for a year, I could. So if you sell everything, you can live for a while. And they were expecting Jesus to come back quick. They were not expecting 2024. They were expecting Jesus to come back quick. When that doesn't happen, all of a sudden you read in uh, Paul's epistles that every church he goes to, he takes a collection to bring it back to the church in Jerusalem. Why? Because they sold everything, and they're sitting there waiting for Jesus to come back. And when Jesus doesn't come back, when they got it wrong, they become impoverished. And so the, it's, the whole expanding church has to take care of them. So in the context, it's not that you have to sell everything. We all live together in some kind of big communal house. And nobody owns anything. In the context that we interpret that passage, we realize that they got it wrong, that Jesus did not come back right away because he's not here. So he didn't come right back. And so then we get this message that the last two message, the message that can be interpreted, the message of context, is that we are still supposed to be concerned about everyone else. That if someone is impoverished, we are supposed to help them. If someone doesn't have enough food, we are supposed to feed them. If they don't have enough to drink, we give them drink. If they don't have clothes, we give them clothes. You know, all those things. That's the message that is there with the context, that we are in this together, that we have to take care of one another. Not the way that they did it, because that method failed. But the idea is that we have to take care of one another. Now that's a message that, that lasts and can be interpreted. And so when you then jump to the, the gospel, you've got a gospel passage that is meant specifically for us. This is not a story that John is telling about Thomas. I feel bad for Thomas. I really do. Thomas gets a bad rap in the gospel. So the way the story goes is it's Easter Sunday night. So Jesus comes up out of the grave. At sunrise, it's been a long day for Jesus. At night, he comes to these apostles, and they're in a, a closed, locked-up room. It's Easter night. Uh, the usual Pentecost story that we know is the one from the Acts of the Apostles. It's 50 days after Easter. Uh, the Holy Spirit comes down, tongues of fire, rushing wind. The apostles are so empowered that they rush out of the locked room, and they go to the streets of Jerusalem, and they start to preach Jesus. Well, that's not what happens in John's Pentecost. So Jesus comes, it's Easter night, he appears to them, he breathes the Holy Spirit on them, and then nothing happens. Okay, nothing happens. And one guy is not there, this poor guy Thomas. Don't know where Thomas was, but Thomas isn't there. Thomas comes back, the other ten say, we saw Jesus. And Thomas has those famous words, i got to take my finger and put it in his wounds. i got to take my hand i got to slip it into his side, or else I will not believe. A whole week passes. Not a word about that week. Nothing said about a whole week's worth of time after they saw the resurrected Jesus. Now it's tonight. Okay, the second Sunday of Easter. So one, two, night. Jesus appears to them again. Again, the doors are closed. All right, they're still afraid. So Thomas has watched for one week these other disciples who said that we saw the Lord, and they did nothing different. Okay, they're still scared, locked in the room. They haven't done anything for a week. They haven't gone out and started preaching about Jesus. They've been locked in that room, and Thomas is looking at them, and Thomas is thinking, if I saw the resurrected Jesus, I would not be this scared to be sitting in this room. I would do something. But they don't do anything. And so Doubting Thomas, I think, gets the rap because this is the only bad story about Thomas, but forevermore he's known as we're Doubting Thomas. But the thing that he, doubt, he doubts is he's not so much maybe Jesus, but these guys don't show any sign that they believe in Jesus. They don't show any sign that Jesus appeared to them. And because they don't change, Thomas doesn't change. And so the message that, that really transcends the, uh, the actual account of Doubting Thomas, because it's not about Thomas, it's about us. Blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. That's you and me. We don't get to see, but we're here because they hope we believe. And so what the Gospel of John is telling us in its closing chapters 
is he's talking to us, not to Thomas, not to the ten. He's talking to us. And he's coming into this church. And he's saying, I know you can't see with eyes, but you can still see me in other ways. And so just like, you know, you have to have a filter to look at tomorrow's eclipse, we need a filter too to see Jesus. And the filter is how we live. Words are cheap. We can say all the things that we know we're supposed to say to be a Christian, but unless we live into the faith, unless Jesus is, unless Jesus in us changes us, then we're like those ten that didn't even convince Thomas. So our challenge is to try to believe so strongly that we change. And then you tie in that first message about not only being concerned about you know the ones within these closed doors, but we're concerned about everyone. That anyone who's empowered, anyone who's in need, that should be a part of our faith, just as much as worship is. So when you give a thousand dollars off of little pies and a beautiful quilt, when you give a thousand dollars to people that you may never ever see, that's living into the gospel. All right? All of those wonderful things that this church does, the continuing food drives, with all of the things you do to support this community through the Sunderland Elementary School. That is the context that makes the faith real. So for all of us, may we continue to believe strongly in that Easter mystery where we have not seen what we believe and may it change us so that others can see Jesus through the filter of how we live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And our communion hymn today is Let Us Break Bread Together Bush. Red Hymn number 288. good to give God thanks and praise. We give you thanks, God of majesty and mercy, for 
the beauty and the bounty of the earth, and for the vision of the day, when sharing by all will mean scarcity for none. We rejoice you call the entire human family to this table of sacrifice and love. We come in remembrance and celebration of the gift of Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be the good news. Born of Mary, our sister in faith, Christ lived among us to reveal the light and life of your grace, to suffer on the cross for us, to be raised from death, and then to live in glory. We bless you, gracious God, for the presence of your Holy Spirit in the church among us. With your daughters and sons of faith in all times and places, we praise you with joy by saying, Holy, 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 holy God, God of love and majesty, the whole universe speaks of your glory, O God most high. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of our God. Hosanna in the highest. And you may be seated. We remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion, that Jesus took bread, gave you thanks, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Ministering to you in Christ's name, I share with you the bread. In the same way, Jesus also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
ministering to you in Christ's name, I share with you the cup. body and blood, that we may faithfully proclaim the good news of your love, and that your universal church may be a rainbow of hope in an uncertain world, through Jesus Christ our Redeemer. Amen. Uh, before we hit our closing, I just got to tell you, because I'm part of the uh, Committee on Ministry, uh, the group that vets um, people who are on their way towards ordination and ecclesiastical council, uh, not this uh, one that we just heard about, but the New Hampshire Association. We just met with her on Monday, and she was defending her ordination paper. And when she talked about um, being able to reside at communion, uh, she actually got teary-eyed. And, you know, I've been doing this for a lot of years now. And it just reminded me, and, and, it, and I hope I never, ever forget, uh, what a sacred privilege this is to be able to share in communion, uh, to come together at Jesus' last supper table in remembrance of him and to share in communion with all of you. And uh, her tears as she thinks about doing that after ordination, uh, it just reminded me of the sacredness of what we have just shared. Uh, the one that you heard about today in our announcements, her uh, Please Ask for Council is coming up next Sunday. Um, I, I'm not in Franklin Association uh, com, so I don't know her person, but I have read her paper. And she was in a really scary automobile accident, which is the point where she almost died. And she is um, handicapped because of that accident. And a lot of people, I think, after going through something like that, they could blame God. Why did this happen to me? Um, her story is, is that it changed her. And that she saw in her brokenness um, a, a special connection with Jesus crucified. And so she writes about that in her paper as well. And it convinced her that she is called into the ministry. And so if anybody is interested, I'd be more than happy. I can go right by here to go to Greenfield. I can pick you up here. Uh, but I would like to share with you that ordination paper so that you're not going in there cold. Um, and it's, it's, um, you know, it's our responsibility, since we are in covenant with all of these churches together, uh, to make sure that the ones who are called are ready for ordination. Um, by reading that paper and voting, that is part of our sacred covenant and com uh, community coming together. So if you'd like to have that paper before next Sunday, please let me know. Uh, if you'd like to go with me, please let me know. Uh, but now let us turn to our bulletins for our hymn of closing. Shalom to you now.
commission to bear the good news of life eternal through the examples of lives that we now lead. So the grace of the risen Christ may be poured upon us. The promise realized by Jesus on Easter is now shared with each of us. The promise of all of eternity lays ahead of us. So let us now go forth to love and serve the risen Savior in all that we do, among all whom we may meet. Amen. Thank you.